I've seen the same thing in, in the psychology departments, although we have the, uh, what would you call it, the luxury of being bounded at least to some degree by the empirical method and by biology, right? Mm -hmm. It's one of the things that keeps most of the branches of psychology relatively mm -hmm. sane, you know, because the real world is actually built into it to some degree. But if you accept the postmodernist claim of radical relativism, then you completely demolish the idea that there are quality levels that are associated with education because everything becomes the same. Mm -hmm. And that seems to me to be a perfectly reasonable justification for maintaining ignorance. You know, like Foucault, I actually found him the most readable of the Lacan, Derrida, Foucault triad. You can read Foucault. I read Madness and Civilization and a couple of his other books, and I thought that they were painfully obvious. You know, the idea that mental disorder is in part a social construct is self-evident to anybody who has even a smattering of psychiatric training. I mean, the, the real narrow medical types tend to, to think of a, 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 a me mental disorder, let's say, as something that might be purely biological. They have a pure disease model, but nobody who's a sophisticated thinker ever thinks that. It's a, partly because medicine is a brand of engineering, not a brand of science, because it's associated with health, and the diagnostic categories are hybrids between physiological observation and sociocultural condition. Everyone knows that, and so when I read Madness and Civilization, I thought, well, that's not radical, that's just bloody self-evident. But Well, you know, Foucault's admirers actually think that he began, you know, the entire turn toward, toward a sociological, uh, you know, grounding of, of modern psychology. The social psychology was, was well, well launched in the 1920s, for example, you know, for, right. I mean, the, the levels of ignorance that these, that these people who think Foucault is so original have not read Durkheim, they've not read Max Weber, they've not read Irving Goffman, okay, so in other words, all, to, to me, for, for everything in Foucault seemed obvious, okay, because I had read the sources from which he was borrowing without attribution. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so again, I, I know these people, I mean, I, I've met, I mean, in some cases, you know, knew them in graduate school. People who went on to become these 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 admirers of Foucault, Lacan, Derrida, and I know what their training was. Their training was purely within the English department. That's all they ever knew. They never made any research outside of that, right? And so, so the idea, so, the, so the, Foucault is simply this ease, a mechanism. It's like a, a little tiny kit by which they can approach everything in culture, and then and then the but the contortions of language, the deliberate labyrinthine elitist language, at the same time as pretending. To be a leftist, okay? This is a, one of the biggest frauds ever practiced. So I got a story to tell you that you might like because I've thought a lot about that use of language, you know, because language can be used as camouflage. And so here's the story. I think I got this from Robert Sapolsky. So he was talking about zebras, and zebras, of course, have stripes, and hypothetically, that's associated with camouflage. But it's it's not a straightforward association because zebras are black and white and they're on the veldt along with the lions. The lions are camouflaged because they're grass colored, but the bloody zebras are black and white. You can see them like 15 miles away. Yeah. So, okay, so biologists go out to study zebras and they're like making notes on a zebra and they watch it and then they look down at their notes and then they look up and they think, uh oh, I don't know which zebra I was looking at. So the camouflage is actually against the herd because a zebra is a herd animal, not an individual. And so the black and white stripes break up the animal against the herd, so you can't identify it. So this was a quandary for the biologists, so they did one of two things. One was drive a jeep up to the, to the zebra herd and use a dab of red paint and dab the haunch of the zebra or tag it with an ear tag like you use for cattle. The lions would kill it. So as soon as it became identifiable, the yes, the predators could organize their hunt around that identifiable animal. That's why, you know, there's the old idea that lions and predators take down the weak animals, but they don't. They take down the identifiable animals. So that's the thing, is if you stick your damn head up, you get picked off by the predators. And so one of the things that academics seem to do is congregate together in herd-like entities, and then they share a language, right? Yes. And the language unites them, mm -hmm. and also keeps them as long as they share the same set of linguistic tools among themselves, they know that there isn't anybody in the, in the coterie that's going to attack them or de destabilize the entire herd. And that seems to me to account for that impenetrable use of language. It's, it's, it's group protection strategy, and it has absolutely nothing to do with the search for 
It's the search for security within a system and not the desire to expand the system. So, so true. But and to me, it's blatantly careerist because it, it, was, it was about advancement and it was also about the claim that somehow they have like special expertise. This is a special technical language. No one else can understand it. Only, only we can. But what's absurd about it, absolutely ludicrous, all right, is that these people, these, these American academics, are imitating the contorted language of French uh, translations from the French, okay? When Lacan is translated, translated into, into English, right? There's a contortion there, okay? What, he's, what, he, what he was trying to do in French was to break up, okay, the neoclassical formulations that descended from Racine. There was something that was going on, there was a sabotage of the French language going on that was necessary in France, not necessary in English. We, we have this long tradition of poetry going back to, to, to Shakespeare and Chaucer. We have, we have our own language, far more vital than the, than the French. Oh uh, yeah, the French constrain their language all the time. Yes, sir. By, by the, 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 absurd, the absurdity in the amateurism okay, of, of American academics okay, trying to imitate okay, a, a, a translation of Lacan okay, when Lacan is doing something in France that is absolutely not necessary and indeed wrong to be doing in English. All right? So the, 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 the utter cynical abandonment okay, of the great tradition of, 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 you know, of, of the English departments. Right? And I, I, I felt that the true radicalism was not about adding on other departments. Okay, so we have African American studies and you know and, and and women's studies and so on. The true radicalism would be, have been to to shatter the departmental structure. That's what I wanted. I feel that was the authentic revolutionary 1960s thing to do, right? To 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 blend all the liter literature study, you know, studies together, okay? To, to to make easier to make an interdisciplinary kind of organization, uh, you know, closer to the British model where a person can pursue related subjects, overlapping subjects. Uh, they, they, these 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 departmental models, okay, are were were to me totalitarian to begin with, okay, separating language into fiefdoms. Okay? And, and what, what this did to, to create